Welcome to the newest edition of the alumni webinar series. Today's webinar, Understanding Stress Management, Keeping the Bees in the Hive, is brought to you by Syracuse University's Offices of Career Services and Alumni Engagement. My name is Jenna Terman. I'm the Assistant Director for Alumni Programs and Career Services. I will be your host today. Due to some technical difficulties we had the other day with audio, um, we don't happen to have a live audience for this presentation, but uh, at the end you will see the presenter's contact information, so you can always follow up with any questions that you might have at that time. Um, we do appreciate any feedback that you would have about the webinar series, and my information will be included down in the chat box that you can also see in the recording as well. Uh, questions will be welcome, like I mentioned, after the end of the presentation. You can always reach out to Brian. Without further ado, I'll introduce our pre presenter today, Dr. Brian Hickey. He's a professor of Science and Sport Management at Florida A&M University in Tallahassee. He is a product of Syracuse University and Notre Dame Bishop Gibbons High School. In 2008, he was inducted into the Notre Dame Bishop Gibbons Hall of Fame. Brian brings a unique perspective to the field of stress management. His academic preparation in exercise science and psychology provides him with a wide range understanding of the mind-body link. In his 13 years tenure as an exercise science professor at Florida A&M, Brian has studied the physiological effects of stress in addition to teaching applied stress management techniques in various health classes. Outside of his regular teaching responsibilities, Brian regularly speaks to uh, both student and professional groups on how to effectively manage stress with a perfect timing coming up onto the holiday season and finals and end of semester work. Uh, Brian is also a lifelong athlete and the current coach of Florida a and He's not teaching, coaching, training, or competing. He can be found at a Candlebox concert or watching Syracuse University lacrosse games. Uh, the aforementioned notwithstanding, Brian is most proud of being the son of Fred and Terry and Rachel's husband. Thank you, Brian, for taking your time to present today on stress management, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jenna, and thanks for that great introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about managing stress, or as I call it, keeping the bees in the hive. And we're going to, when we look at stress management, the the main stress glands are the adrenal glands, and then so when the adrenaline leaves the body, I call that the bees leaving the hive. So let's, let's before we get into that, let's take a look at some key terms. Got uh, several of them here: homeostasis, stress distress, eustress, flight or flight, and adrenaline. Homeostasis, the body likes a constant, stable environment, and that's what homeostasis is. So the body is always trying to maintain homeostasis, maintain a constant, stable environment, and it, it's always trying to right the ship. Think about it as a, uh, a HVAC unit. So if the room gets too hot, the, the air conditioner is going to kick on, it's going to pull the temperature down. If the room gets too cold, the heater's going to kick on. It's going to pull the temperature up. So we have oppositional hormones, and we're going to get into those in a couple of minutes. When we look at stress, what stress is from a physiological perspective is just a disruption in homeostasis. The red light comes on, and the body says, hey, we got to do something. Now, in terms of stress, there are two types. There's eustress, and there's distress. Distress is bad stress. So anything that our mind perceives as bad is going to be a distressor. Eustress is a good stressor. So anything that any disruption in homeostasis our body perceives as good will be will, will give a, a, a eustress effect. Now, what's interesting is when we take a look at the body, we can have a dividing line across the neck, neck up and neck down. Uh, neck up, the body, the mind perceives stress as either good or bad. Neck down, the body is going to respond to distress and eustress the same way. And the way it responds is through, the first phase is through what's known as fight or flight. Fight or flight, from a physiological standpoint, is the body's survival mechanism. And the hormone that initiates fight or flight is going to be adrenaline. So taking a look at, at stress. Stress, as I said, anything that disrupts homeostasis. So anything that disrupts our body's constant stable environment. If we think back to this morning when we were asleep, 
and then all of a sudden the alarm goes off. Well, our body was in homeostasis, asleep, nice, warm, comfortable bed, having some nice dreams, and then all of a sudden, bang, that alarm goes off and our body wakes up. So the, the waking up process through an alarm is gonna be that disruption in homeostasis. When we take a look at uh, the, the, the two types of disruptions, we, we have chronic and acute. An acute disruption, that's going to be short term, that's going to be uh, on the magnitude of minutes to hours. Chronic, that's going to be our long term stressors. Those are going to be days to weeks. So when we take a look at an acute stressor, it could be that alarm, it could be the car not starting, it could be we're sitting in a meeting and we get a text from a loved one that just says, uh, that just says hi, I love you, and that, that knocks us out of our our homeostatic orbit, if you will, where we're in meeting mode and all of a sudden, hey, we have a, a use stressor or hey, my, someone that loves me is thinking of me. So quick sidebar there, tell the ones that you, that you love, you love them. Um, anyway, getting back to uh, homeostasis and, uh, and stress management, our chronic stressors, those are going to be long term. Those are going to, for example, we take a look at what's getting ready to come down the pipe right now. We're looking at the holidays. Thanksgiving coming up in, uh, that would be a week from today. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Thanksgiving being the kickoff to that, that five week real intense holiday period. Uh, for, for the people at, for my, for my fellow Orange, getting ready for your final exams, uh, that's gonna be a chronic stressor, end of the semester crunch, uh, as I call it with my student athletes, our, we're into fourth quarter academics right now. So stress can either be short term, long term, but it's going to disrupt that constant, stable environment that the body craves. So it's going to it's going to be any any event that's going to disrupt our homeostasis, any event that disrupts that constant, stable environment. So taking a look at the two things that produce stress, event importance and event uncertainty, these two. Uh, these two concepts combine to either to either create you stress or create distress. And, uh, the more important the event and the more uncertain the event, the more stressful it's going to be. So looking at some of the athletes that I've worked with, a game, a game is going to be stressful. Now, depending on, on the athlete and depending on their psychological profile, hopefully it's going to be you stress. It's going to be a stressor that they want, but it's going to be important because you only get, depending on the sport, you only get about 20 games a year. So it's going to be something different than practice. So is it important? Yes. Um, the other thing we take a look at is event uncertainty. In terms of uncertainty, we can reduce that through planning. So when we're looking at uh, when we're looking at final exam time for the students, or we're looking at the holidays for uh, for for more of my grown folks out there. Event importance and event uncertainty coming into play is is whatever function we're going to be attending, how important is it? And then the other thing is, how do we reduce the uncertainty? How, how can we plan? Uh, how can we break out our crystal ball and predict uh, some of the some of the variables that we're going to see and then reduce the variability through proper planning? Um, moving on taking a look at our two types of stress just to reinforce we have you stress and dis distress now uh, I know we, we probably have some uh, hopefully we're gonna have some single folks and some married folks looking at this uh, presentation down the road and when you when you think about your first date with your either with for me I'm gonna look back and think about my first date with Rachel or uh, or maybe the first date with our with our significant others that's gonna be a you stressful event it's gonna be important but it's also gonna be uncertain so my first date with Rachel, is it an important event? Yeah. Did I know I was going to marry her? Eh, I didn't know right away. Um, but, um, but I knew that, hey, this is somebody special and this is going to be a special event. So there was, there was some importance to it. And then the other thing is, how's the, how's the night going to go? Uh, there's going to be a, a uncertainty to it as well. So neck up and neck down, neck Oh, Brian, we lost you. I see the microphone there, but I don't hear you. My speakers are working.
So taking a look at our two types of stress, you stress, good st distress. You stress, think about that as the first date. So in terms of uh, in terms of you stress, is it something you want to do? Yes. Is it something that you don't normally do? Yes. So the body is going to undergo physiologically a stress reaction. Uh, taking a look at distress, uh, distress is going to be bad stress. So think about waiting in line, sitting in traffic, any of life's little annoyances. Is it going to be something outside of your normal standard operating procedure? Yes. Is it going to be something that you don't like to do? Yes. Uh, so. The body is going to respond physiologically the same way, whether it's you stress or distress, whether it's good stress or bad stress. We can reduce both of those through event importance and event uncertainty. So keeping things in perspective and also through planning. Taking a look at a, a brief uh, historical and biological ideology of stress, the first thing from a physiological standpoint is fight or flight. Fight or flight is the body's basic paleolithic survival instinct. So back in the day when we were, we all lived in caves and we were all very, very fast, very, very strong physically, the, uh, the body's stress mechanism was designed for self-preservation. And then the, the main hormone that made us very, very fast, very, very strong, that superpower pill, if you will, is the hormone adrenaline. Uh, which is the the stress and survival hormone. It's in the in the literature. It's also referred to as epinephrine. Um, but for the sake of this presentation, we'll go with adrenaline. Adrenaline is secreted by the adrenal glands, which rests right on top of the kidneys. So moving along, taking a look at our our physiology of stress. So how does the how does the body respond to a a stressor? So what we're looking at here is. Everything that's going on below the neck, anything uh, the body perceives a disruption or homeostasis, is it good, is it bad? It's one of the two and the body's gonna kick into high gear and we're gonna have a, a stress reaction. So we look at the nervous system. Uh, the nervous system is where it all happens. So the nervous system that responds to a stress or a disruption in homeostasis is gonna be the autonomic nervous system. You can think of autonomic also as automatic. So we don't consciously think about a disruption in homeostasis. Our, we perceive it mentally and then bam, our autonomic nervous system takes over. So the effects of the autonomic nervous system are going to be subconscious. Uh, there's two branches, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And taking a look at our, our diagram here, our sympathetic, what will happen is in sympathetic activation, our body gets revved up. We move into that fight or flight. And in terms of parasympathetic, parasympathetic, our body tunes down. Our body sl slides into a rest or digest state. Now, what's interesting, I've worked with a bunch of athletes in, in my career. At the, we had a, uh, back in the day, we had a stress lab here at, at FAM with, with my colleague, Dr. Jim Kellogg. And we found that our, uh, the best, our best athletes were parasympathetic dominant. So our best athletes, our best musicians, our best performing artists, they're going to be parasympathetic dominant. In other words, the parasympathetic nervous system will dominate, will, will run the show throughout the day. The only time that the sympathetic nervous system comes on, that fight or flight, is when they're doing their thing. When the athlete is on the field playing the game, the sympathetic nervous system is going to kick on. The uh, when the when that musician is on stage doing playing their craft, the sympathetic nervous system is going to come on. The um, I had a, one of my uh, one of my buddies, professional musician, would always say, "Hey, you get the show for free." You get the 90 minutes that I'm on stage, you get that for free. You pay me for there 22 and a half hours. So what he would do is he would be parasympathetic dominant for 22 and a half hours. Those are the hours that they're, that they're paying him for. And then the, uh, the other side, the, the sympathetic dominant, and that's only 90 minutes. And that's what, um, that's what you get for free. So, uh, when we take a look at, um, at, at parasympathetic and sympathetic, when we're doing our thing, whatever our thing is, 
That's when we that's when we allow our body to, our body to slip into sympathetic dominance. When we're doing everything else and we're doing our regular daily ops, the key there is going to be parasympathetic. Take a look at sympathetic activation. This is when the bees leave the hive. We talked about earlier the title of the uh, presentation, keep the bees in the hive. So in other words, stay as parasympathetic dominant as possible. So parasympathetic activation or sympathetic activation is when the bees leave the hive. Think of this right here. This is my adrenal gland. And then these bees, that's my adrenaline. I only have a limited number of, of bees to leave the hive. I only have a limited amount of adrenaline to leave the body. So what happens when the bees leave the hive? The first thing that happens is we get this release of epinephrine. Epinephrine is a hormone, also goes by the name adrenaline, and what it does is increases heart rate, increases respiration, and increases blood pressure. So in other words, it gets us ready for physical activity. The other thing it does is it redirects the blood flow from all of our auxiliary organs to the skeletal muscles. So adrenaline is getting us really, getting us prepared to be really, really fast and really, really strong. That's that fight or flight. Now, when stress goes into overtime, uh, our, the, uh, the, adre the adre adrenaline lasts mm, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then after that, I got to call in my second wave of hormones, and the second wave of hormones is, is uh, cortisol. So what cortisol does is prepare the body for, an, for a chronic stressor. The adrenaline is going to be that short-term stressor, or as cortisol is going to be my long-term stress. And what cortisol does is it increases blood glucose and it, uh, it gets the, the muscle and the liver to open up the tanks and release glycogen into the blood. And that's what's going to power our cells for our chronic stressors. So we're looking at long-term fight or flight here, um, and, and the body is going to need to call in the reinforcements. So what happens is our body, uh, the, the cortisol tells the body, hey, open the tanks. So muscle, uh, muscle liver glycogen flow out. And our body uses muscle and liver glycogen for energy. Now, uh, when we take, we talked about the mismatch of stressors, what the body wants to do and the body has to do. The majority of our stressors are going to be psychological. They're going to be time, tension, technology. Those are my three main stressors in America today. They're not saber tooth tiger coming over the hill. So we have that mismatch of what the body wants to do, get really, really fast, get really, really strong, gird up our loins and take on our predators versus what's it, what it actually has to do. We got to sit at the desk, uh, dictate the memo, wait in line, deal with the problem student, whatever it is. So um, in, in terms of stress, we have that mismatch and we run into problems here because increased cortisol, increased blood glucose, these are getting us ready for physical stressors, but point three, where we have the majority of our stressors being psychological, our blood, our blood sugar levels go up our, because our body wants energy to, do, uh, to, pro, to prolong our physical strength, but we're not doing physical strength. We're, do, we're sitting at our desk where our stresses are predominantly sedentary. So in response to increased blood sugar levels, our body secretes insulin and insulin is going to scour the blood and take that glucose that got released from my muscle and liver and store it away as body fat so our, our next point is that now after our stress has passed we're going to be hungry and all we've done is repackaged our glucose from muscle and liver glycogen into body fat but we're going to be hungry and our body is going to want to eat carbohydrates in order to replace our missing glycogen, in order to replace the, the uh, muscle and liver glycogen that got drained by the cortisol for that long-term, that our body perceived that long-term stress. Here's the other thing that we take a look at. 
Why does stress get us fat? That's one of the big issues in America today. The first thing is the repackaging of the muscle and liver glycogen from muscle and liver glycogen into body fat, our blood, our blood glucose, our glycogen stores are, are drained down, our body craves sugar to replace the missing glycogen, and then here's the other thing we take a look at. Psychological stress runs down our decisions. Psychological stress le uh, leads to poor decision making. and. We're going to go from a nutritional perspective, we're going to pick our processed carbohydrates for two reasons. The first thing is that they're easy. Processed carbs, if it comes in a bag, if it comes in a box, there's a good chance it's got processed carbohydrates, lots of sugar in there. Um, and they're going to be easy to eat, they're going to top off our, our blood glucose, they're going to top off our muscle and liver glycogen. And the other thing is that for many people, our sugar, our high sugar foods are going to be comfort foods. We have a, a stressful day. We run through this cast, this hormonal cascade of the cortisol being released, muscle and liver glycogen being drawn down, ch changed into body fat, and then our 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 nutritional choices dictating that we that we fill up our, our muscle and liver glycogen stores with easy carbohydrates and we eat easy stuff and they taste good and we feel better. We had a stressful day at the office, maybe we got stuck in traffic, uh, we're gonna, we are going to come home, have a comfort food, and we're gonna feel better psychologically. It's gonna be that psychological Band-Aid. So taking a look at one of the main problems, and we've been touching on this throughout the presentation, but one of the main issues is that the majority of our stressors in America today are psychological. However, our body responds to all of our stressors as if they're physical in nature. So we had a, a, a issue with a boss, coworker, student, professor. Um, we had a, maybe a student going into office hours. Uh, they didn't do as well on a test as they had thought. And the, the neck down perceives I'm being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, where the neck up says, hey, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to Crazy Doc's office hours to find out, you know, what, what's going on with this class. So we have this mismatch between what the body wants to do and what we what we are doing or what we are what is societally acceptable. Our body wants to gird up our loins, fight and fight or flight, but physical but psychologically, we need to it, it's gonna be a a sit down, uh, maybe a somewhat of a contentious debate over whatever it is um, where, uh, where we're not gonna where we're not gonna do anything physical. So we talk about perception and individual response. Perception, what the mind, and here we have a uh, classic scene from the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the uh, the infamous sales meeting where we have uh, we have the boss coming down yelling at the uh, at the, the salesman. So this is what the mind knows is happening. The mind knows that I'm sitting in this in this meeting. I'm getting yelled yelled at. My sales numbers aren't where they have to be. I may get fired. Now, neck down, what the body what the body perceives or what the body thinks is happening, and what the body responds to is we're getting chased by a cheetah here. We got to get really really fast, really really soon, or we're going to be really really dead. So, um, perception, what the mind sees, uh, is it is it a psychological? stressor or is it a physical stressor? The majority of stressors in America are going to be psychological. And then individual response, individual response, everybody responds to the same stressor a little bit differently. So one of the keys in terms of stressors, event importance and event uncertainty. In terms of individual response, how do I how do I perceive that stressor? Is it the end of the world, or is it ah, it's not nothing? And we're gonna, or is it somewhere in between? And we're gonna get into those in a minute. So we take a look here: perception, individual response. Perception is your view. Over here we have two symbols from the Chinese language. One means crisis. Uh, they both mean crisis. One is in danger, and one is in opportunity. And we notice this symbol right here. And it's constant in both uh, in both symbols. 
So what we look at here is, is in terms of perception, do we view it as a danger or we do, do we view it as an opportunity? You get two people that are exposed to the exact same circumstance. One person views it as a opportunity for personal growth. The other person views it as a threat to self-esteem and to self-efficacy. So one of the keys in terms of stress management, one of the main takeaways from today is viewing disruptions in homeostasis as a challenge rather than a threat. Viewing them as an opportunity to learn something about yourself, viewing them as an, as an opportunity to develop new skills, new knowledge, skills, and abilities, as opposed to a threat to your self-esteem or your self-efficacy. The other key that we take a look at in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of crisis, in terms of a disruption in homeostasis, is that no two people react identically. So looking at empathy, and, and when we look at dealing with the, the people that we love, dealing with our loved ones, is how we respond to a stressor, that may, that may be completely different than how our loved ones respond to the exact same stressor. So the principle of individual response, and that's going to help us develop patience and develop empathy when, when things quite aren't, aren't quite going as planned. Other issues to consider, uh, and these are huge. Um, well, what we look at here, the first thing, it takes about six hours for the body to return to homeostasis following about a 10 minute bout of intense stress. So we have this, this 10 minute bout, intense stress, whatever it is, argument, disagreement, stuck in traffic, in terms of distressors, maybe in terms of, uh, in terms of you stressors, um, want maybe uh, in terms of the holidays, so somebody that we, somebody that we, that we really enjoy their company, they pop over unexpectedly. Um, it's, it's still going to disrupt our homeostasis, but it's going to be something that's going to be good. We're going to get that shot of adrenaline. So once the body goes into that, that stress process, it's going to set into effect a hormonal cascade. So adrenaline, cortisol, other supporting hormones that it's going to take the body about six hours to return to homeostasis. Now think about um, maybe for um, for every any everybody that's in long term relationships, you have that uh, that disagreement with loved ones, and it it always happens. Um, I should, it shouldn't always happen. I take that back. It happens once in a while, infrequently maybe. Um, my uh, quick shout out to my parents. They've been married for fifty five years, and uh, Fred and Terry. Terry says, "Hey, rule number one of marriage: you disagree." You patch it up, you get over it. Fred, my dad, his number one rule of marriage, compromise. So we have a, a, a marital disagreement on whatever. It takes about, about 10 minutes, uh, and then, and then the, uh, the issue is um, after about 10 minutes, our bodies had enough, and we, maybe we retired to, uh, to separate quarters. Now, here's the thing we look at. It's going to take about six hours for the body to return to hormonal homeostasis following those 10, that 10 minute bout of intense stress. So our first point to consider in terms of stress management is when we start heading down the road of a disruption in homeostasis, and we talk about event importance, event uncertainty, is, is this event, is this point of contention worth the next six hours of my life? Is it worth upsetting the apple cart and keep on taking the wheels off the wagon for the next six hours of my life? If the answer is yes, then proceed. If the answer is no, figure something else out. The next thing we take a look at is adrenaline refills. And what, I, what we mean by this, again, draw that line across your neck and say neck up, neck down. Neck down, that's just the machine. The, the body, the adrenal glands, they can't tell if you are actually in a disagreement, if you're actually in a conflict, or if you're thinking about the conflict. So the, um, the mind, if you're thinking about some argument, the mind is, is, is actually believing that you're back in that, in that conflict. Now think about when, whenever we have a, a disagreement and it lasts 10 minutes and then we go our separate ways and you go to wherever you go and it's not, okay, I'm back to business as usual. It's, 
you know what? The next time they say that, I'm going to say this. Oh, they said this. I should have said that. And when we're running through that, the body is topping off that adrenaline. The bees are leaving the hive. There's more bees being sent out of the hive. And there's more adrenaline that's being secreted. And then when the ad more adrenaline is secreted, that six hour clock is reset. So one of the things that we look at in terms of decision making, in terms of disagreements is for the, uh, for the adults that are listening, for my grown folks, nothing good happens after 10. For my college students, nothing good happens after midnight. And, uh, and, and what I mean by this is that by, um, at, at, at 9, 10 at night, the things that we would have let go at 9 or 10 in the morning in terms of, of disagreements, we're, we're going we're gonna to be a little bit more sensitive to them. And uh, we're going to make a bad decision to engage in, in some sort of a contentious debate. And that's going to set into effect that six-hour cascade of adrenaline, cortisol, winding the body up. And, uh, and then when we're done with that, so we have a disagreement at 10, we're done and it, we, it, it uh, eventually wears itself out by about 10, 15. So now it'll be 4, 15 in the morning the next day by the time our body has rid itself of all those hormones that, that built up during that 10, 15 minute bout of stress. But when we go back to our separate our, uh, our separate quarters, we start thinking about it, and it's going to be 11, 12 o'clock, and we're still going to be thinking about that disagreement and what we should have said or what we're going to say the next time. And every time that we think about it, we get another shot of adrenaline. So nothing good happens after 10 p.m. So after 10 p.m., one of the main keys for stress management, know thyself. Know that you're out of decisions. Have a cue with your spouse where just tell them, look, I'm out of decisions. 10 o'clock rolls around. I'm out of decisions. We're not going to talk about anything intense now. We're going to save that for, for another time. So knowing that we have a finite amount of decisions each day, we tend to run out of them at the end of the day. So we don't want to make any big decisions at the end of the day. We don't want to get in, involved in, in any uh, intense debates at the end of the day. Because that's going to set an emotion, our, 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 our stress response, and that's going to upset the apple cart for the next day. Taking a look at our downward spiral of stress and also looking at that downward spiral of hormonal, the uh, hormonal cascade. So the first thing we do is we have stress. We have a distressor. It negatively affects us, and we respond with anger. And we, we lash out at somebody or, or if I'm, we, get, we get that feeling where if I'm having a bad day, everybody's going to have a bad day. And we're, we, are, we are angry. We have a sharp tongue. We're, we're likely to say something that we don't mean. Uh, and then when we do, we, we reflect on it. We have guilt, worry, fear. And then uh, we have guilt for what we said. And then we have worry and fear that, hey, I shouldn't have said that. And since I said it, I, I may have caused some damage to uh, this relationship. And that's going to cause more stress. More stress is going to cause more anger, guilt, worry, fear. And then we get this downward spiral right there. Um, so the, one of the keys in terms of, of stress and stress management, know thyself. Know, know what situations give you distress and then... When we look at, in terms of anger, knowing that that's, that's a, a last resort. Taking a look at our worst types of stressors, uh, stressors that are, that are predictable, are, they're not as bad. But our worst types of stressors are stressors that are frequent, intermittent, unpredictable. So they rear their ugly heads at various times throughout the day. There's no way that we can plan around them. So our worst types of stressors, they take that event uncertainty equation or that, that event uncertainty component and they keep it in the, in the equation because they're always popping up. They're, 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 they're popping up, but we can't predict. Um, like in terms of traffic, one of, uh, one of the things that, that always bothered, bothers me is sitting in traffic 
and I'm fortunate enough in my career where I can schedule my arrivals and departures at, at FAM around the traffic. So I'll have office hours or I'll have classes that go a little bit later so I don't have to sit in traffic and, and waste that time. Um, so, so what we look at is trying to fine tune our day to eliminate uh, our intermittent stressors and also f trying to figure out a way to get them more predictable so that we can have a strategy to, uh, to deal with them. The other thing we take a look at in terms of our worst types of stressors, those are the ones that are psychological rather than physical. Like I said, uh, our fight or flight hormone, adrenaline, that's to get us ready for physical stressors. Those are, adrenaline is that hormone that gets us really, really strong, really, really fast, and it gets us ready to deal with survival, lifting a car off of a loved one or swimming across a river to save somebody that's drowning. Uh, that, that's adrenaline taking over and doing what it's supposed to do as opposed to um, sitting in a meeting um, or, uh, or dealing with, with some sort of a, a psychological construct. Getting into the holidays and uh, holidays looking and also looking at for our students out there our exam time and uh, this moves into what we call what I call psychoneuroimmunology or the effect of stress on health and basically this word is der derived from psycho which is psychology neuro which is the nervous system immune the immune system and then ology the study of. So the study of the relationship between the mind, the nervous system, and the immune system. Uh, an interesting study that I, that I examined back when I was at the CUSE was the relationship between the time in the academic calendar and the strength of the immune system. And what this study found was that as the semester uh, rolls along, as you go from the beginning of the semester to the end of the semester, Psychological stress is going to increase because event importance increases. And then the other thing that's going to happen is that the immune system is going to wear down. So at the beginning of the semester, uh, the, the researchers found that the immune systems were the strongest. And then as finals came around in the most important time, uh, academically, the immune systems were at their lowest point. So. What we look at here in terms of chronic stress is that the mind perceives stress, the, the uh, nervous system attempts to restore the homeostasis. So um, my, my psychology, we have this, this, my body disrupts, my body perceives a disruption in homeostasis. My body perceives event importance, event uncertainty. It tries to restore homeostasis through interactions with the nervous system. What this does is it diverts energy away from other body processes. So my body is secreting adrenaline, it's secreting cortisol, it's dragging down the energy, the, uh, the energy that, that could be going to run in, running the immune system. And then because the immune system isn't running at its optimal functioning level, bam, we get sick. So one of the keys for moving into finals weeks and then moving into the holidays is to have high body awareness. Watch what's going on with your immune system. If you have a, if you have a little bit of a sniffle, if you feel, your, feel a cold coming on, make sure that you're getting rest. Uh, in, in terms of rest, sleep is when the body grows and repairs. The body needs eight hours of sleep each day. My athletes, now they're going into finals, they're getting about four hours of sleep a night. Uh, we're gonna address that at practice tonight. But um, in, in our high stress environments, we may need nine hours of sleep a night because our body, our mind, and our nervous system are running overtime. And if we don't take care of our immune system, our body's gonna get sick and tell us, hey, you didn't, you didn't rest when you should, now I'm gonna make you rest. So in terms of getting sick, Watch your, your body's cues. Your body's going to be telling you, hey, I'm getting, I'm getting a little sick here. I got, I got a little bit of a cough. I got a little bit of a scratchy throat. I got a little, little bit of a, an, an earache. Um, and, and that's going to be the body's way of, of, of subtly telling you, I got to get more rest. 
I got to I got to get more parasympathetic sympathetic activation, and I got to tune down this this sympathetic activation. So uh, our body's immune system running down tells us we're running that sympathetic a little bit too heavy. We got to switch more to, to that parasympathetic nervous system. Other moderating factors to look at mood. Uh, again, high self monitoring. If we find ourselves being a little bit more edgy than we normally are, and this this happens during the holidays, is that's going to be our body's way of saying sympathetic nervous system is a little bit too tuned up, pal. We gotta we gotta get m more of a, a parasympathetic balance. We gotta get more resting, more more relaxation. Another moderating factor of the in the immune system is going to be seasonal affective disorder. The body, the mind loves nature. It loves to be outside doing things, being active. And in um, one of the double whammies of, of the, uh, the holiday season is that there's more of a draw on our time and there's less daylight to get out and enjoy the outside. So in terms of seasonal affective disorder, get outside, especially on the weekends. Do something, do some physical activity outside for everybody at, at the Q's. Um, head over to Green Lake State Park, take a walk over there, or uh, maybe uh, maybe on the canal path in Fayetteville. Um, but, uh, but get out, enjoy nature. Nature is Red Bull for the brain. And then the, the other thing we take a look at is going to be nutrition. And in terms of, uh, in terms of nutrition, we, we, we said earlier that, that periods of chronic stress goad my body into going with the, the simple carbs. And, and that sets into a, a whole cascade of negative events, another downward spiral, if you will, of uh, insulin secretion, increased body fat. So with, with nutrition and uh, make the, the, the key points in terms of keeping that immune system healthy, psychoneuroimmunology is going to be uh, 64 ounces of water every day, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. Those are going to be essential um, uh, for, um, for keeping that immune system healthy, especially right now going into the holidays. Uh, email me questions about, about nutrition. And that's a whole nother presentation. So moving into looking at five ways to keep the bees in the hive. The number one question for stress management is, will this matter 10 years from now? What we're looking at here is addressing event importance. How important is this event? Now, there are going to be some events that are going to be very important. And because they're important, bam, they merit a stress response. They merit letting the bees out of the hive, whatever it is. Uh, but the majority of, of stressors trying to find a parking spot at Destiny USA, will that matter 10 years from now? I don't think so. Um, but um, but we're, what we're looking at here is addressing event importance. So we, we address event importance by keeping things in perspective. The other thing we the other thing we do is we address event uncertainty, and we're going to reduce this through planning. And that's my internal and external locus of control right here. So internal locus of control, external locus of control. The people that have an internal locus of control, the people that believe that they are the captains of their own ship, they're going to have a lot less stress than the people that perceive that they're they're just pawns in the game. So when we look at inter, when we look at locus of control, the the more I believe that my decisions impact my destinies, my my decisions impact my behavior, my choices uh, get me to where I want to go, the the bigger my internal locus of control and the less stress, the less distress I'm going to have. So the key to an internal locus of control, taking ownership in your decisions, planning. Uh, there's planning away, delegating away in terms of leadership, delegating away whatever little stressors that, uh, that I can. Point number three, know thyself. Know, know the things that upset you and figure out strategies to avoid them. Uh, what we look at in terms of know thyself, we talk about your daily strategy, 
plan. So one of the number one rules of business, pay yourself first. One of the number one rules of stress management is come up with some non-negotiables. Uh, in terms of non-negotiables and paying yourself, what are three things that you're going to do for yourself every day? What are three things that you're going to do to make yourself a better person for the people that you love, for the people that you work with? So, and then pay yourself first. Make sure that you get those non-negotiables done every day. Maybe it's 20 minutes of exercise or 20 minutes of reading or 20 minutes of spiritual growth. Whatever it is, come up with three non-negotiables where at the end of the day, when they're accomplished, you're going to feel good about yourself. You're going to build your self-esteem. You're going to build your self-efficacy. So pay yourself first. Uh, come up with, in, in your daily strategy, in your daily planning, come up with the, the three non-negotiables where I'm getting these things done. When I get them done, I'm going to feel a lot better about myself. The other thing we take a look at in terms of know thyself, stress avoidance, figuring out those things that, that distress you. What are those, what are life's little annoyances that get me every day? And we get trapped and we're going, we just, we find ourselves heading down that spiral. And where, where, where is it that I can nip those things in the bud? and avoid them. Avoid life's little stressors. Know that after 10 o'clock, after midnight, I run out of decisions so that, hey, after 10 o'clock, after midnight, I'm going to protect myself from myself. That's when I'm going to take it in and maybe I'm going to work on 20 minutes of intellectual growth. Maybe I'm going to read that, start reading that book that, uh, that I've always wanted to read. The next thing, point four, is huge. Daily exercise. Use adrenaline for what it's designed to do. We said earlier that when you have that distressor and you have that cascade of hormones, adrenaline gets released, cortisol gets released, maybe we get a couple of adrenaline refills in there along the way, it's going to be six hours, eight hours until our body writes its ship hormonally. Well, what exercise does is it cuts that time because what we're doing is we're using adrenaline for what it's designed to do, namely lift heavy objects and sprint. The human body is designed to do three things, cover long distances slowly, lift heavy objects and sprint. And when we are, uh, we, we spend the majority of our time covering long distances slowly physically in terms of our, our activity of daily life. As we get older, we don't sprint as much as we used to when we were kids, and we definitely don't lift heavy objects. So when you are going to exercise, when you go to the gym, spend that 20 minutes, half an hour, lifting heavy objects and sprinting, because that's what the adrenaline is designed to do. Adrenaline is designed to make you really, really strong and really, really fast. So match the physical activity with what adrenaline wants you to do and you're not only will you be getting physically stronger but you will also be draining down that adrenaline in time short uh, one of the things as a quick sidebar the importance of daily exercise we need to be physiologically and psychologically strong we got to be physiologically and psychologically strong to carry the ones we love we never know we never know when our loved ones are going to lean on us for either physiological or psychological support. So we have to train for that every single day. And that's the importance of lifting heavy and, uh, and sprinting. And the last thing we take a look at with daily exercise is get outside. Talked about that a minute ago. But in terms of getting outside, nature, Red Bull for the brain. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You want to, get, you want to, uh, to, to become more creative? Do your physical activity outside. Get out of the gym. Um, even uh, I know speaking to my Syracuse crowd, we're going to get the uh, get the snow. Go outside. Shovel the shovel the uh, shovel the sidewalk. That's we're lifting heavy objects and uh, we're being outside, clearing our mind. That outside air phenomenal for us. Our last one we take a look at parasympathetic activation. So my parasympathetic system is driven through deep breaths. You take a deep, slow breath through the nose, and that's going to turn, that's going to downregulate my sympathetic nervous system, and it's going to upregulate my parasympathetic nervous system. It's going to get the body ready to rest, to digest. Uh, when I was a kid, and I'd get all fired up, 
and my mom would always say, hey, Brian, deep breath and count to 10. And, and you're thinking, ah, that, that stuff doesn't work. But from a physiological perspective, deep breath, count to 10 is amazing. And here's why it works. The first thing is that the body can only concentrate on one thing at a time. So if you have that annoying coworker and they're in your office and they're talking about whatever it is they're talking about and you take that deep breath and you count to 10, when you're counting to 10 silently, your mind is focusing on counting to 10. It's not focusing on that annoying coworker. And then the other thing we take a look at is the deep breath is going to slow down my sympathetic nervous system and it's going to upregulate my parasympathetic nervous system and the adrenaline is going to stop flowing through the body as fast as fast as it was so heart rate's going to drop respiration is going to drop blood pressure is going to drop i'm going to mellow out i'm going to be a lot more calm so parasympathetic activation through deep breathing the other thing that we take a look at why through the nose not through the mouth again and when we breathe through the nose, we're getting a slow trickle of air into the lungs. And what that does is, again, upregulates my parasympathetic system and it downregulates my sympathetic nervous system. My sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. When we're engaged in, in sprinting, when we're engaged in lifting heavy objects, our body is demanding large volumes of oxygen that we're taking in through the mouth. And on the flip side, the, 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 the other side of that coin is when we breathe through the nose, our body for, is, is forced to downregulate the sympathetic system and get that parasympathetic system working on uh, getting that tuned up. So deep breath count to 10. Mom was right. Uh, that, that gets my parasympathetic system fired up. It gets it, uh, it, gets it working. Last thing we take a look at, stress resilient personality. Uh, quick one over here, this is my man, Billy Ward, 2014 team captain, Syracuse lacrosse. This was the, uh, the goal he scored in double overtime against, uh, against North Carolina that, um, that really launched the 2014 season, uh, really rebooted the season. And, uh, and my man, Billy, is one of the one of the kings of a stress resilient personality. So uh, some of the characteristics of, of becoming more stress proof long term. The first thing, belief in self and being comfortable with self. So the, the, the belief that, hey, you know what? I'm not for everybody. Um, and I know for me, I know going in, I'm not for everybody. I know that, that by the end of the day, somebody's going to be upset with me. It, it's not going to be because I went out of my way to get somebody upset with me, but it's just that I'm not for everybody. Uh, the second thing we take a look at in terms of developing my, my stress resilient personality. So comfortable with self and then an optimistic view. One of my favorite sayings in the whole world is it's not nothing. And if there's anybody from the, uh, the English department, uh, Looking at my presentation, I know it's a double negative, but um, it's just that uh, when I was when I was training for the uh, when I was on the USA East track and field team a long time ago, and we we're down on Long Island, and that was one of our mantras where where it's not nothing, and and what we would mean what we mean by that is hey, if I lose a race today, it's not nothing. There's another race tomorrow. Um, even even if um, even if tomorrow's race isn't isn't as big as today's. Or, or tomorrow's race isn't as uh, isn't going to be a championship race. It's still going to be another time, another another opportunity for me to uh, to improve my my physical being. So it's not nothing. Um, it's uh, it's just it's just one piece of the puzzle. The next thing we take a look at in terms of developing my resilient personality is meaningful relationships. So in terms of um, in terms of meaningful relationships people that count on us. We talked about that earlier in terms of our loved ones and the need to be physically strong, be mentally strong for the ones we love and, and know in terms of meaningful relationships that, hey, there's people that are dependent on me. I can't be distressed over every little thing because I got people that are counting on me. Um, and then the last thing we take a look at is being excited about the challenge. We talked earlier in the presentation, we had that slide up that said um, that they looked at at crisis versus opportunity and how every every 
time that homeostasis gets disrupted, that's a challenge for us. It's a challenge to see, hey, how am I going to respond? How how am I going to how how are my stress management tools working? So looking at every new situation as an opportunity for personal growth, as not as a way to develop self-esteem, as a way to develop self-efficacy. So developing that stress resilient personality. How are we going to make ourselves bulletproof, comfortable with self? It's not nothing. No one looking big picture. Knowing that, hey, there's people out there that are counting on me. And then being excited about the challenge. Every day is going to give us uh, something new. Every day is going to give us uh, another opportunity to grow. So we're getting down down to our our final points here before we wrap it up. The first one we take a look at is zebras don't get ulcers. um, In terms of of stress, chronic stress, uh, that adrenaline, the cortisol, it winds the body up. It makes us want to do something physical, but... We don't do physical things by and large in America anymore. So our body is forced to do something physical internally to deal with that adrenaline, to deal with that cortisol. One of the things it does is it runs the digestive tract over time. And so an ulcer is when the when the, uh, the stomach actually digests itself. There's so much adrenaline going through the body and the body has to do something with it. It's, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just digest my stomach. Uh, it's very irrational, but that's the one of the ways that stress is manifested in the body. So in terms of zebras, zebras don't get ulcers because they do what the adrenaline tells them to do. They slip into a fight or flight mode, adrenaline drops into their nervous system, and those cats get really, really fast. And they just sprint the daylights out of that adrenaline, and they get to safety. So zebras don't get ulcers because they do what the adrenaline tells them to do. Uh, Point number two, the majority of our stress is acute. So the the majority of our stressors are short term. uh, They're going to go away. They're life's little annoyances. So that brings us to our final point in terms of stress management. Will whatever disruption or homeostasis matter 10 years from now? Before you launch into a stress response, deep breath, count to 10, strategize. Is this going to matter 10 years from now? Well, I remember this 10 years from now. If the answer is yes, then we go down the stress response cycle. If the answer is no, we go to the, uh, the other alternative. It's not nothing, and we just let it go. So that is, the, uh, that is our big so what. Uh, I enjoyed working for everybody today. Thank you for attending. Here's my contact information. Uh, Run Bike Doc, that's my brand. So uh, you want to reach out for me on email, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Hit me up on my blog. I'd love to interact with you. Uh, Thank you for taking time out to view this presentation. And go Syracuse. Thank you, Brian. That was awesome. I definitely learned a lot of uh, good things, especially coming up into the holidays. Um, You answered some of my questions already. I was going to ask about personality types and stress, but you touched on that a little bit there at the end because I do feel like I um, I don't really know when I am stressed, I guess. I, I don't really feel it, I guess, um, which kind of leads to one of the questions about how do you know or recognize the good stress and know that you're, you're getting that? Uh, um, that's a great question, Jenna. So when we take a look at, at stress, whether it's you stress, whether it's distress, uh, neck down is going to respond the same. So heart rate's going up, or your respiration, your breathing is going up, your palms may get a little sweaty, um, and the palms are going to get sweaty because muscular activity is increasing. And when muscular activity increases, your body produces heat and then as a, as a response to producing heat, your, your body initiates a sweating response for cooling. So whenever your body is undergoing a disruption in homeostasis, the, the signs of us getting ready for physical activity, respiration goes up, heart rate goes up, palms get a little sweaty, we can feel that heart beating in our chest, whether it's good or whether it's bad. The, um, the, the endocrine system and the, the, the uh, cardiovascular system are going to respond the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Definitely. 
Um, thank you. I, I, the, most of the other questions I had were about the personality, but I think the stress resilient piece definitely touched on that. So thank you so much again for taking the time to do this. Um, I definitely appreciate All right. you getting out there and spreading the word about your knowledge. Um, and hopefully people will follow up and connect with you through all of these resources that you provided. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Very good. Bye.